The following is a production of Texas Lutheran University. For more information, please visit tlu.edu. Texas State, uh, Dr. Bob McLean. Uh, Bob is a Canadian. He uh, got his, uh, his BS in microbiology from the University of Guelph in Ontario. Uh, went, to, went to Alberta and got his uh, PhD from the University of Calgary. And uh, then went back to Guelph. Uh, back around my area of the, of the world, and uh, <laughs> uh, went, did a postdoc back at Guelph, was a research assistant professor at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario for a while, and then came down to Texas, got, got wise and came to Texas. There we go. Did. And uh, he's been at uh, Texas State since 1993. He is a full professor there now, and is very active in the American Society for Microbiology. He's the regional director, what is it? For regional branches. planning coordinator. The regional planning coordinator for the Texas, for the, uh, for the ASM branches. So, uh, and does a lot of work with the, with the Texas branch and also nationally. Uh, he has interests in music and outdoor activities. And uh, he's gonna talk to you today about a, a really, um, I think, uh, up and coming field, the field of uh, biofilms, is something that microbiologists had are just now becoming aware of, I suppose, uh, in many cases. So, uh, without further ado, welcome, Bob McClay. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm quite thrilled to be here. In uh, uh, last uh, Christmas, I believe, I was visiting your um, fine arts building just a few buildings away. I have a hobby where I'll sing and uh, some good choir, so I was doing the Messiah with the Mid-Texas Symphony. That was fun. And uh, you're really fortunate. You have an excellent university here, and you have some really nice uh, cultural events going on, so I greatly appreciate being here. This um, uh, picture is the uh, picture of the uh, crew from uh, the Columbia, which was the uh, sh space shuttle a few years ago that actually crashed upon re-entry. And I had the privilege of having an experiment on that particular shuttle. So we'll talk about that close to the end of the uh, seminar. But I wanted to introduce you to biofilms. And uh, th this is more of a interesting, there'll be a little bit of research put in, but I, I wanted to gear this talk more for uh, general interest. So if we think about biofilms, and I'll define biofilms, these are, we're just going to call them surface adherent microbial communities. So one that you're familiar with, I don't advise doing it right now because you haven't washed your hands, but if you ever scratch your teeth, that white stuff that comes off your teeth is called dental plaque. It is a type of adherent bacterial biofilm. And if you have visible plaque, anybody have any idea how many individual organisms you might have in something you could see? <coughs> anybody have any ideas? Yeah. Well, you're getting there. You'd at least have the population of San Antonio in one of them. So there's quite a few. Bacteria are small. So there's... Um, have a lot. Now, naturally, why do bacteria grow as biofilm? So they, these are two pictures in San Marcos. This is uh, Aquarina Springs or Spring Lake, and then this is a uh, mile or two downstream in the San Marcos River. It's a real nice place to go. It's half an hour or so north of here. Um, summer, it's nice to tube. The water temperature is uh, 70, 71 Fahrenheit year round. Really pleasant. But uh, it's probably a little slow right now, but the the spring, or this lake here, is uh, the water will completely turn over in volume approximately every eight to 10 hours, like just because of the spring flow. And that ultimately feeds the river. And then this river will join the Blanco, ultimately the Guadalupe, and end up down at the Gulf of Mexico. Now, if you're a microorganism living in an environment like that, you can survive suspended in the water just provided you reproduce enough to maintain a population. Now, if you're further downstream, uh, by, as by this Rio Vista Dam here, it's been, this is the old dam that's been modified, but one of my former students, Matt Garner, um, is modeling what you have to do. 
you have to stick onto a surface. Otherwise, you're going to end up at the Gulf of Mexico. If you're in the oral cavity, you stick onto a tooth, the gum, the tongue, wherever. Otherwise, you either get spat out or else you get swallowed. So there's a, an incentive for bacteria to want to stick to surfaces. And so it lets them persist in an environment, and it also gives them some protection. Now, um, <clears throat> this is uh, a picture of taken with a confocal microscope, and that's a way you can get a three-dimensional view. But the thing I want to show you here is that these little light green dashes here are individual bacteria. And what you'll see is they form clumps, and then there's going to be regions where there's not very many bacteria. And so the term here, we call this a microcolony, and then uh, this area here would be called a water channel. And those, you don't need to necessarily remember them, but if you read any biofilm, uh, literature, that's what you see. And then this is where I've drawn the two arrows here. This would be like a side-on view. So you can see there's areas with very few cells in some areas, and then others with microcolonies. Now, if you ever look at how grass grows in pastures, out, once you get outside a city, a lot of times it forms very similar type clumping. And then there's areas where there's not that many. So this is a common <coughs> biological uh, growth strategy that you see in other organisms, not just microorganisms. Okay, so just to summarize a few key <coughs> aspects of biofilms, if you look at bacteria the way they grow in nature, most of the time they're on a surface. Now, in the context of medicine, there are a number of infections in which attachment to a surface, and often attachment in some numbers, plays a big role. One thing would be medical devices, so this could be something like a catheter, artificial hip, dental implant, any number of things, artificial heart valve. And then cystic fibrosis, that's a genetic uh, disorder that people have, their chloride channels messed up in their cells, and they get very thick mucus by the time they're five or six. Uh, patients with that, by the time they're five or six, their lungs are colonized with bacteria, and they, this bacterial infection will remain the rest of their life and ultimately kill them. But they, they grow as an adherent community. Now, other than the fact that they grow on surfaces, one big thing why people are interested in biofilms is they are very resistant to any type of antimicrobial treatment. Uh, depending on the drug, the way the organisms are grown, a free swimming organism is a lot more sensitive than an adherent organism, and that ratio can be up to a thousand fold difference. So it's pretty significant. And then these, whether they're free swimming, planktonic, or attached, they differ quite a bit. And we're finding not only their physiology, how they grow, but also what genes or portions of their DNA they're used. Very high population density, again, on this. Last, you've got a lot of bacteria living very closely together, and that's going to play a role in some of the things they do. And then in, in nature, they play several functions. Now, a lot of times when you hear about microorganisms, you usually think about diseases, and certainly there's a lot of importance in disease. <coughs> People want to be healthy and stuff like that. But I wanted to show you a few other aspects where they're important. This is looking in the San Marcos River, and I, I didn't have these fish pose for me, they just happen to be there. But you've got water, it's flowing from left to right here, and the fish usually orient so they're facing into the flow. Now, we'll have some biofilms there. They're not always bacteria, it can be algae too, so a eukaryotic organism. But uh, so there, you're going to have some microorganisms attaching to the sediments. You also have aquatic plants and fish. And something that lives in an environment where there's going to be bacteria that might want to attach to the surface, they might have figured out a way to control that. And so one thing we can do if we're trying to figure out a way to stop bacterial attachment or control it, see what's going on in nature and then see if we can adapt that to a, either a medical system or a, another type of system. And so um, that's one thing. Now, 
This is, normally don't think of geology or paleontology as being related to microorganisms or really adherent microorganisms, but this is an experiment that a uh, former undergraduate in my lab, uh, Christy Dunn, did. And Christy was, she was a nice, good solid B student. Um, and Christy was real interested in paleontology. That's study of fossils. And most people think of paleontology, they want to go after T. rex or a brontosaurus or something like that. And, um, but uh, in my department, one of my colleagues is um, Gary Upchurch, is a paleobotanist, so he studies fossil plants. Now, uh, are there many people here that have house plants or anything like that? Few, yeah. Okay. Uh, one of the things you can do for house plants is to mist them, keep the leaves more, uh, moist and stuff. And if you ever mist a plant, just spray water on it, you notice the water tends to bead up a lot. And that's because the surface of the leaves are, is hydrophobic. It's waxy and that. It helps stop them from drying out and stuff like that, but it's, it's a bit of protection. Now, when you're making a fossil, what you're doing is replacing the organic matter that's in a leaf or T. rex or whatever with minerals. And a lot of the minerals dissolve in water, so you have to have something that's hydrophilic or water liking as opposed to hydrophobic or water fearing. And so they're figuring leaves likely fossilize in part in a wet environment. If they're in a wet environment, this, oops, sorry, uh, then among other things, they're going to be coated have bacteria that colonize them. The bacteria are going to colonize them just because they're after some food. So we thought maybe if we had bacteria attaching to leaves that might help with the fossilization process. And so this picture up here is a um, scanning electron micrograph of a real plant fossil. And at higher magnification you can see structures, these little um, uh, barrel-like structures uh, which are look like fossil bacteria. What Christy did in her experiment was she got some leaves, got them to form, grow biofilms on it, just took three or four days, and then she just suspended them in a solution of iron chloride. And Within five minutes they turned brown. It's that same rust brown color you get if you, you probably don't get an urge to do this, but if you lift the back of your toilet, see the rust that covers the inside of the toilet? That's act, that is rust. It's what's happened is the iron's come out of solution, forms this iron <coughs> hydroxide on it. Well, we're getting the same thing on leaves. The ones without a biofilm, they stayed green in this solution for months. So it's, it's stuff that would actually work real well as a classroom type experiment. And Christy managed to get a first authored paper in geology, which is that discipline's um, top journal. Now, the other thing, I'll get a little chemical here for in a few slides, but if you remember uh, that one micrograph where we have a lot of bacteria living together in uh, biofilms. And bacteria are thought of, and they are, single-celled organisms. But when they get together, in high densities, then they start doing things as a group as opposed to being uh, single-celled organisms. And that phenomenon is come to be called quorum signaling. So they just sense when their population density is at a certain threshold or more. And so one of the chemicals, groups of chemicals that uh, use to signal population density is this group <coughs> called uh, homoserine lactones. And so this is an amino acid. Uh, it's derived from the amino acid serine. And then you have a fatty group or an acyl group off to the side. And the length and chemistry of this group will vary from one species to another. So what that allows an organism to say is, how many of my own kind have I got? Now there's other systems where they can tell how many bacteria in general they have. I'm not going to detail that today. But this is. Uh, was thought to be important in biofilms. And uh, back around 97 or so, people were predicting this, but nobody had any experimental proof. 
And so I had a um, friend over from the UK, Dave Stickler, who was at the University of Cardiff in Wales, and then Marvin Whiteley was a grad student at the time, and I was working with Clay Fuqua, who used to be just down the road at uh, Trinity in San Antonio. We dreamed up an experiment over some nice Mexican food to ask the simple question, is um, do bacteria in natural biofilms produce these signal molecules? And so um, what I did was I'll just go back to this picture here. Just went to our local river, got a few stones, and the day I got them, it was mid-March, close to freezing. I'm from Canada. Any place that doesn't have polar bears wandering around or ice on rivers is like midsummer. So I took off my shoes and roll, socks, rolled up my pants, went in, got some stones. And so we got this, uh, this is a black and white micrograph, but this is a biofilm coated stone and a bacterium that turns blue if it rec recognizes the quorum signal. We actually, this was the first experimental evidence that this was going on in biofilms, which was kind of cool. And then, um, one of, uh, this is not my work, this is somebody else's work, Dave Davies, who's at, uh, now at the Binghamton University in upstate New York. But Dave did a molecular biology type approach with several other people, and they found, oops, sorry, if you um, have a normal or wild type strain of, of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, it's just one type of bacterium, It'll form these biofilms with clumps and then other areas where there's open water channels. If you remove the ability of this organism to produce these signals, then the bugs just stack up on one another. So this was the first uh, evidence that, hey, this signaling's actually doing something in biofilms. And other groups, and I, um, let me see, would have got the next one, yeah. Other groups have done, th found that looking at different plants, some plants will produce compounds that mess up the signaling and they won't get colonized with film. So this is actually a very promising area for looking at new treatments, whether it's in medical infections or in other types of things where you might get bacterial fouling. Now, so um, now I want it to shift gears and just tell you a little bit about a current project we're doing. It actually ends up relating to cell signaling, but uh, bear with me for two or three slides and we'll come back to it. So one of the big things that, this is often one of the very first labs you would do in a microbiology course is you just simply ask the question, where are bacteria growing? And so you'd go out, you'd touch a plate, you'd cough on a plate, you'd touch a counter, door handle, water fountain, any place like that, and you'll find a lot of different organisms. And so this is a sample plate, and each of these different colored colonies here that's, um, is, would represent essentially a different species. Uh, the point I'm getting at here is that in real life, you have a lot of different things grown together. Now this is microorganisms. If you go outside here, you've got grass, you've got trees, you've got insects, you've got earthworms, what, all sorts of things growing together. That's, that's real life. Now, what microbiologists typically will do is they'll isolate one of these bacteria, grow it up in pure culture, and then study it. And that, probably 99.9% .9 of all microbiologists will do that. And we've learned a lot how bacteria, cause disease, what they're, how they resist antibiotics, all, all sorts of different questions. But at some point, in order to relate it back to nature, we have to find out how, we, how um, bacteria are able to uh, get together. And at the outset, we were thinking that this is going to be important in both unattached and attached populations. Now, uh, an experiment we did when Marvin was a uh, grad student with me was we isolated some bacteria from the Edwards Aquifer. And that's the water, underground water system that supplies a lot of the um, uh, eastern edge of the hill country, including San Antonio. 
Um, and so we didn't know that much about bacteria that were commonly in there. Marvin isolated a bunch and found out that if you have a lot of different species, you get thicker biofilms. Whereas if you were just plating individual species, they didn't form as much biofilm. So this is one example of where having mixtures might help. Now he did some other stuff too, looking at uh, um, resistance to disinfectants. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the too much details. I just wanted to show you one example of why it might be important to have more than one species involved. So um, this was uh, a few years ago, and Marvin's now a uh, faculty member up at UT Austin. And I had the privilege, sort of life coming around full circle, studying with one of my former students. And it was a lot of fun. And, um, oops, sorry. And so we were really interested in looking what was going on at the DNA level. And um, Marvin's lab at the time was is looking at several mixed culture situations. One of these involves uh, an organism, Pseudomonas originosa, and another one, Staph aureus. And those are two organisms that commonly grow together in lung infections that cystic fibrosis patients get in. And um, Another one is a dental situation. This organism here, which is commonly called AA because it's got a real monstrous name. And it's one that causes gum inflammations, and, but it can also escape from the, the uh, gum in certain situations, get through the circulatory system and cause heart problems. And um, Streptogordonii is a normal flora. It, uh, there's another Streptococcus strep mutans, which is tooth decay, but this one is not. And so this one will cause gum inflammations, but it can also cause an inflammation of the uh, membrane covering the heart, so endocarditis. So those are what Marvin's lab was doing, some of his people. And I thought in both those situations, they were looking at bacteria that had two different cell wall types. Uh, gram-positive and gram-negative. And those of you that have not taken microbiology, that may seem like an abstract concept to you, but the gram-positive ones have a very thick wall, gram-negative have a very thin wall. And uh, I thought it'd be nice at some point to go after two that had similar wall structures. It's going to be challenging, but it, that there's a lot of gram-negatives growing together in nature, and at some point it's worth just figuring out all the technical difficulties and doing stuff. And so at the outset we thought some portion of the genome, the genomes, the, all the DNA material, may be important in letting an organism grow with other types. We didn't know whether it's a major part or a, or a small part of the genome. Now, and our rationale was our two organisms, Pseudomonas originosa and E. coli, they grow in several environments. Uh, they grow together in the gut, and there in relative terms. You have a lot of E. coli, very few Pseudomonas. In, a, in aquatic environments, the situation's reversed. And then urinary catheters, you can have some variability. The thing is, you've got two organisms where you can do a lot of genetics, you can um, and you can start asking questions, manipulate the environment, see what happens to make a population shift. So that was the rationale. Now what a gene chip is, um, if you think of the central information flow in biology going from DNA to messenger RNA to proteins, if you want to find out what an organism is doing, let's say the genome is all the potential that it can do. Now, use human as an example. We have skin cells, we have blood cells, we have um, mucous membrane, nerve cells, and stuff like that. Our cells specialize, so the skin cells are just doing what skin cells do. They don't do what, say, nerve cells do, and so on. So only part of our genome is being used in a different environment. Bacteria, it's the same thing. Um, 
So what we do in the case of gene chips is we extract the messenger RNA, purify it, and then ask the question, what uh, if a particular gene is being used and there's going to be a lot more of that message present? So we can analyze what genes are turned on, what are turned off. And in this case, with E. coli, we're doing uh, four, almost 4,300 genes at once rather than one at a time. With Pseudomonas, it's 5,500. So combined, we're dealing with almost 10,000 genes. So that's, that's why you do those types of experiments. They're pricey, but um, like each time you run one, and you hope you could do it well, it's a thousand bucks a pop. Do you mess up? Yeah, that's, but sometimes it happens. So our, our goals here were to use this to try and identify what genes are being used, and then use a PCR approach, a quantitative PCR to verify it. And then we get, see what genes are turned on, remove the ability of bacteria to do that, and then see if that interfered. So our overall goal was to really understand the mechanism of bacterial interactions. And so this is a former grad student of mine, Mary Weber. She's now doing her PhD at Texas A&M. Mary did uh, this, started doing this project. I did it as well with a different, um, uh, in diff a different strain and different conditions, but she grew these two organisms together, extracted the messenger RNA, and then found out what was going on. So there were some genes that were, weren't expressed as much in mixed culture. Others were turned on more in mixed culture. But the ones that were really surprising were synthesis of purines. Purines are the, one of the two base groups in uh, DNA. So purines are things like adenine and guanine and pyrimidines are the other three bases, so thymine and cytosine and uh, uracil if you're dealing with RNA. So that was what she saw, and the, um, I'm not sure, uh, when we got the purine synthesis mutants and saw whether they did anything or not, we didn't get any results. Uh, it was, there was no difference. But what we were thinking of is, what do purines do in a cell? Okay, they certainly make up nucleic acids, RNA, DNA. Uh, they're involved in energy transfer, so ATP, um, GTP. And their third thing is they're involved in signaling. And so these are three uh, signal molecules that are used. And, uh, We'll be concentrating on this. Um, cyclic AMP is one. In bacteria, it's used to control what sugars uh, an organism might eat. Um, cyclic DiGMP is involved in making adherent bacterial communities, and both of these are also involved in stress. Guanosine tetraphosphate is involved in starvation survival. And so, uh, the one that we found showed a lot was cyclic AMP. And so this is where we've gotten um, different strains here. And in, if we grew the E. coli just by itself, they all behaved roughly the same. There's some slight differences, but nothing major. In mixed culture, if the organism was unable to produce cyclic AMP or unable to respond to cyclic AMP, then it just, it was really non-competitive. So it looked like cyclic AMP was a real important thing here. And one of the things that um, we found was there was a chemical that was being produced called indole, and I'll, I'll give an um, illustration of that in a second. And we found that, again, in the cyclic AMP mutants, we had very reduced indole production. These others are, are one of these is involved in, um, one of these is wild type, the others are different mutants. But the cyclic AMP one's indole was decreased. 
Now, the indole test is something that is one of the tests you may learn about in your uh, introductory microbiology course. This is, uh, this is the reaction. So we have the amino acid tryptophan here, and indole is basically this aromatic or this ring structure here, and it just gets cleaved off by an enzyme called tryptophanase and uh, release this compound here. It has a, a slight smell to it, but um, and this has been used uh, for a long time to distinguish E. coli from other organisms. It's a bit of history. Um, I got really interested in this. The guy that discovered this was uh, F.G. Hopkins, and this is the original reference. It's 1903. If you, if you go on PubMed, uh, if you Google PubMed, that's a search engine for research articles through the National Library of Medicine and then just do indole and bacteria. You'll get a lot of hits. And then go to the last page, which gives you the oldest material. And this guy discovered, um, Dr. Hopkins discovered this back in 1903. He won a Nobel Prize in 1929, not for that. Um, he grew up, uh, I'll tell you a little story about what he did to get his Nobel Prize. Maybe you can figure out what, it, what he found. He was growing some mice, I believe, and he had purified proteins, purified carbohydrates, a few purified lipids. And after a while, the mice, when they were growing just on that very chemically defined food, would eventually die. And so he found that there was some growth extra growth factor. Uh, it, some were soluble in um, things like alcohols, others were, were water soluble. Anybody have any idea what, what that stuff was? Give you a clue. One a day. Vitamins. vitamins. He was the discoverer of vitamins. And he's also the founding. Uh, chair of the biochemistry program at Cambridge University in the UK. So really interesting. I'd, I'd, uh, so, but typically what you see in the lab is a positive indole test. You add a reagent called COVAX reagent. It turns red. Negative test would look like this. So bacteria have been known to do this for a while. Now, so back to our mixed culture stuff, what we found was that if you remove the ability of bacteria to produce indole, they all, uh, this is E. coli, they became non-competitive. If you add indole back in, which is this filled-in thing, they regain competitiveness. Now, if you go back to the cyclic AMP mutants and add indole back in, it restores it. So it looks like indole is real important for bacteria to grow, or at least E. coli to grow in this mixed environment. So this is uh, taking something that is just some weird and wonderful test. It's actually important for them to do something. And one of the things we notice in mixed culture is normally with Pseudomonas, if you grow it in mixed culture, the lighting's a little bright here, but the Pseudomonas will produce, grow as a blue-green colored culture. Now if you grow it with uh, wild type E. coli, it loses that pigmentation. And that pigmentation is a compound called pyocyanin, which is actually toxic. Uh, Pseudomonas produce that to compete against other organisms. So that's like chemical warfare going on there. The uh, E. coli is just simply blocking production of this chemical. Now, that chemical is produced by Pseudomonas when it has high population density. So what about some other things? And so these are... Uh, two virulence factors, the ability to degrade proteins and the ability to produce a detergent-like molecule. If you grow Pseudomonas in pure culture, it has both these virulence factors. If you grow it in mixed culture, they're greatly reduced. And then spreading over a plate is essentially a function of this um, detergent-like molecule. So what we've got here is potential uh, inhibition of quorum signaling. And so to wrap up this part, then I'm going to shift gears. Um, we've got uh, 
So cyclic AMP and indole help E. coli grow in mixed culture. It seems to inhibit corm signaling. The big significance of this is that a lot of the ability of Pseudomonas to cause disease is regulated by population density. So we might have hit on a way to help hinder the ability of Pseudomonas to cause disease. This is an organism that's certainly important in um, uh, cystic fibrosis, but it's also very important in burn infections too, and a few other things. Okay, now I wanted to shift gears and, uh, uh, and this, is, um, this project happened a number of years ago when I got asked to help some seventh grade or eighth grade kids do a science fair type project. And these um, students were from Port Lavaca, which is down the Gulf Coast here. And um, they, um, the question I got asked was, you'd like to help these students, they have something that might be of interest to NASA. So I said, sure. What I didn't realize was they and their teachers had a connection with a company that actually flew commercial payloads. So we got a shuttle experiment out of it. And that, um, this one happened to be on the one that John Glenn went on, which is kind of cool. And so this is, uh, the, the question we were doing was asking, that, can bacteria attach to surfaces if you take away gravity? And um, so this is the discovery launching. And the experimental setup we had there was we had a couple of plastic discs. They were maybe a oh, foot long, three, four inches wide, uh, inch thick and two of them would slide back and forth. And on each of them, you'd have these little wells. And um, we had one where we'd just suspend bacteria in a uh, slight salt solution. And then we'd have the bacterial food. And these things would be misaligned during launch and landing. And then in orbit, astronauts would just simply turn a little dial. These two things would align and the bacteria would try to get at their food. And we'd had a little membrane in between them that would uh, let the food get through, just not let the bacteria. And we were at seeing, can the bacteria attach to the membrane? And um, so this was uh, a microscope slide with one of our astronauts to show you the, the scale here. And I had ended up having uh, eight students and their teachers, and there was a lot of interest because one, the students were involved, and second, you know, having John Glenn part of this uh, mission was kind of cool. And I actually was, I um, got my two sons, that's my younger son, who's uh, Alistair, who's now a, a sophomore at, at New Mexico State, and Malcolm, my older son, who's a uh, senior at Colorado, but, um, and, uh, bunch of others and I actually had the kids taking collecting data that was fun and the students from Port Lavaca when they went back home they got paraded through town on a fire truck now this is Texas normally you have to win state football to get that treatment so there was one day where science was cool then life went back to normal but uh, but we think for that one day and this is uh, the first published evidence that bacteria can grow on uh, attached to a surface. This was a um, confocal micrograph. Now, having said that, that was fun doing that experiment. We were not the first to do this experiment. There was a group out of Montana State that did that work, similar work a year or two before we did. They never published. So if you're ever in a situation you're working with a professor and they ask you to write up what you're doing, they know what they're talking about. So that way you get credit. So, they, um, now, uh, a few years after that, I got a phone call in the middle of the summer. I said, Bob, how'd you like to do another shuttle experiment? Sure, those, those things are incredibly cool. And I think with you know, some of the political debates going on, it, it's a shame we're seeming to wind down a lot of the space program. But uh, our original idea was to say, if you grow bacteria in, in mixtures, what if you take away gravity? 
normally you get one to dominate, the others will just be role players. And so we set up, originally set up three different organisms. We could tell them apart using several different techniques. And this was launched on the Columbia. And this, I actually took some people down for the launch. And that was incredibly cool. The shuttle uh, feels like a, it, they're about the size of a 737 or a Southwest Airlines plane. And you can feel them in, in your chest like they're really loud. And um, so this was our payload before it launched. This was an actually in orbit picture in one of the astronauts, Kalpana Chala was here, and those of you in front might see a Sharpie that's sort of floating in midair. It's, this is in, in orbit, so it's microgravity, and that's her payload right behind her. So this was the launch, and uh, I just took pictures as fast as I could here. So the shuttle goes up, then starts curving, flying against, that's the shuttle there. And then on February 1st that year, that shuttle actually uh, crashed on landing and we had seven people got killed as, as a result. And this was actually our payload here. It survived. It landed in a parking lot in Nacogdoches. And um, a few months later we got access to it. And um, this is, uh, these are just some pictures from uh, collecting the, the, our samples at that. Um, and this was uh, John Cassano, whose uh, company flew the payload, and then his daughter Valerie and I were collecting um, our samples from it. And we didn't get our original organism. We got another organism uh, that was this orange-colored thing. It was an actinomycetes, and we did some sequencing to find out what it was. And it belongs to this genus Microbispora. And this is a, um, uh, so th this was an unexpected result, but if you think of the shuttle crashing, uh, you know, very, it's really tragic with the loss of life in that, granted. But one of the things we we're unexpectedly able to do was uh, test a component of a theory called panspermia. And panspermia is the thought of life going from one planet to another. Now we can think of Star Trek, we can think of Star Wars and all that sort of stuff. Realistically, if we're going to move something from one place where life could occur to another, unless you're in a spaceship or something, it's likely going to be microbial. And so one of the things that's going to happen for life to move, let's say, from Mars to Earth or vice versa, is it's going to have to survive getting into space. There's a lot of energy involved there. When it's in space, you've got hard vacuum, you've got hard radiation, uh, temperature extremes. Um, it's got to survive that. The final stage is once it gets near a planet, it's got to survive passage through the atmosphere and impact. So with this accident, we're in a very unique position where we could test that. And so the... Um, from this experiment, we think, and we have no way of running a control on it, but we think we've found something that lends support to the idea that microbes, assuming they survive ejection, space transport, they can survive impact, atmospheric passage and impact. So the, um, with that, I just wanted to thank, I have some really good people in the lab, um, various collaborators, and former students. We call ourselves the Slime Gang because biofilms are slimy, so it's a great name. And, um, the, uh, and then this is Marvin's lab, and I, it's nice to have a senior citizen in your lab. So they, um, and uh, I just wanted to uh, realize we had seven people on the Columbia that lost their lives over this. And, um, then I'll, with this picture, the Hubble Space Telescope, I want to thank you for having me and I'd be willing to take any questions. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you Thanks. very much. Uh, what happens a lot of times, and I don't know the microbiology, I always want to know, when a CF child uh, 
uh, is treated with some type of a major antibiotic to knock the pseudomonas down. Right. Typically, after the gills comes back. How, how does that work? A lot of that would be microbial competition because you get similar things going on in the mouths of people if the flora is knocked down or in some case the female reproductive tract if the flora is knocked down then you can get uh, candida albicans, a yeast infection overgrowing and so that's uh, there's some other situations too if you get flora knocked down in the GI tract you get uh, an, um, clindamycin is one drug, you get an organism called Clostridium difficile that can overgrow and cause problems. So it's actually, those issues I think are a lot of times related to ecology at the microbial level. You're removing competition, so something that's normally a bit player can all of a sudden come up and do something nasty. So, so is it a combination of both of the organisms that make the lump tissue fibrotic, or is it mainly the I would guess, well, Pseudomonas is dominant, but it's not the only thing there. So it, uh, it produces some compounds. Uh, you know, Piocyanin is just one of several things that it does to compete against other organisms. So uh, that's, that's what I would uh, think, yeah. Yeah, we, we didn't see any sign of them. At one point, we thought we'd found Pseudomonas, but it ended up being a mislabeled gel. So uh, n none of the original three bacterial species were found on the, the moss? No. I, I checked my, er, my samples, and there was also a sample uh, that was sent by an Israeli group, and they'd sent, I forget whether it's E. coli or bacillus, um, and I tried to isolate their stuff and also get DNA uh, signature in case some of the, um, basically the ribosomal uh, RNA actually survived and I, I could not detect that. So um, this one, the, the big question with that is I have no control saying how did that microbispora get there. It's a soil organism, we're guessing that it came in by some dust that happened to be in the air, and uh, but I have, I just don't have experimental controls or replicates to show that. So, uh, is that anybody else? On your other experiment uh, in the shuttle, uh, the one with the high school folks. Yeah. Uh, were those bacteria modal? Yeah, that was Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Yeah, we just wanted to ask the question, can bacteria form biofilms under microgravity? Pseudomonas experimentally is one of the easiest organisms you can get to attached to a surface in the lab, and I wanted to use that uh, as a proof of principle, so that was why we did that one. Do you think it would have affected it if they had, uh, if there had been a non-modal uh, bacterial species? You can, but there are organisms like Staph aureus and Staph epi, uh, both gram-positive cocci, they're non-motile. They form good biofilms on, especially if you have a, a venous catheter that's crossing your skin surface. It's a big problem with uh, if you have a, if you're on IV for a prolonged period of time, it's a, it's a source of infection for, uh, say, uh, ICU wards. Well, thank you all very much. Students at TLU engage in high-impact educational experiences that include civic engagement, aesthetic expression, critical thinking, and a focus on intercultural knowledge in a community that welcomes the interplay of faith and reason.